I'm Duncan Purdy. Martina Arroyo, Carlota Ordaschi, Doris Yarrick, Sopranos, Betty Allen, Doris Alkerson, Regina Strafferty, Shirley Verrett, Mezzo-Sopranos, Louise Parker, Contralto, and the Symphony of the Air, directed by the late Leopold Stukowski, and The Ride of the Valkyries from Act Three of Richard Wagner's Die Valkyrie. We'll uh, be able to relax uh, very shortly uh, with The Sleep of Cichet by César Franck after this interval. It's about four... There are only three days we've taken about as far as we can at this point. Back to our legends and myths in this hour of montage. It's nearly 17 minutes past four. From the symphonic poem Ciché by César Franck, Paul Strauss leading L'Orchestre Liège in The Sleep of Ciché. That's part of the ballet music from Gounod's Faust. But for nearly 20 years on WQXR, it meant Alma Dettinger and her daily interview program, Other People's Business. Alma remained a constant friend and faithful listener to WQXR long after her retirement from the show in 1960. And we remember her still with fond affection. A True Story, from 1937. WQXR was by then the preeminent fine music station in New York. But we were no longer the only one. With much fanfare and great public excitement, NBC announced the inauguration of broadcast concerts by the newly formed NBC Symphony Orchestra. The first program, under the direction of Arturo Toscanini, was set for Christmas night. And at the home of a wealthy patron of the arts, a formal dinner party had been arranged. After supper, the select company of guests in tuxedos and evening gowns retired to the drawing room, where they sat listening to the radio symphony, hushed and attentive. Suddenly, the butler appeared, wagging frantically for attention. The hostess tried to ignore him, then to shush him, but he insisted on being heard. Finally, he broke the sacred silence. Madame, he intoned gravely, you are listening to WQXR. We have Toscanini in the kitchen. This WQXR moment of memories came from the Nights in Latin America broadcast of November 2nd, 1967, and was presented today by W.R. Grayson Company, the original sponsor, Prue Devon, and her unforgettable series. I'm Duncan Purdy. And now, Payne Weber presents Symphony Hall. Yes, tonight, WQXR's Symphony Hall is presented by Payne Weber. Payne Weber, who believes that great performance is what really counts. Thank you, Payne Weber. Music of Papa Haydn starts off this evening's Symphony Hall. Herbert von Karajan leads the Berlin Philharmonic in a performance of Haydn's Symphony No. 85 in B-flat. Now, this symphony was the result of a commission by the fashionable Paris organization, the Concert de la Loge Olympique a concert institution that was frequented quite often by the Queen and her ladies-in-waiting. The subtitle, La Reine de France, comes from the fact that the symphony was said to have been Marie Antoinette's favorite. So this one's for you, Marie. The Berlin Philharmonic, led by Herbert von Karajan now, Haydn's Symphony No. 85 in B-flat, La Reine.
Tonight, WQXR's Symphony Hall has begun with the Symphony No. 85 in B-flat of Franz Josef Haydn, La Reine, the Berlin Philharmonic conducted by Herbert von Karajan. And tonight, Symphony Hall is a presentation of Payne Weber, for which we do thank you, Payne Weber. He's your new baby son, Mr. and Mrs. Ryan. Oh, look at him. He's so cute. I wonder what he's thinking. I'm thinking about how you're going to finance my college education. He looks so serious. I am serious. It'll cost a lot of money to go to college by then. You guys should ask a Payne Weber investment executive about zero coupon bonds. Look, he's got your nose. But he's got your mouth. Well, the better to talk to Payne Weber with. If you guys buy certain maturities of zero coupon bonds for $10,000 today, in 20 years, they could be worth more than 100000 And I'll be a BMOC car girls, my own door. Look, he's smiling. We're going to open up a savings account for you. No, no, no. Payne Weber zero coupon bonds. With a shiny new silver dollar. <laughs> Why is he crying? To get your attention. Look, we're talking sophisticated investment instruments here. He probably wants his bottle. Oh, boy. This could take a long time. Call Payne Weber and ask about zero coupon bonds and your child will say... I wonder what he's trying to say. Thank you, Payne Weber. Member SIPC. Our month-long birthday tribute to Aaron Copeland, who turns 85 on the 14th, continues tonight with a performance of his Music for Theatre. Copeland writes, Music for Theatre was written with no specific play in mind. It had started with musical ideas that might have been combined as incidental music to a play with the right one at hand. The music seemed to suggest a certain theatrical atmosphere, so I chose the title after developing the ideas into five short movements, the prologue, Dance, short and jazzy, interlude, a kind of song without words, and burlesque, best described by its title. Leonard Bernstein leads the New York Philharmonic in this performance of Aaron Copland's Music for the Theater. Beginning tonight and continuing every Monday evening at 7.30, Hambro and Zadie, the popular team whose keyboard artistry brightened our broadcast schedule for so many years, will be reunited for concerts ranging over the entire gamut of music composed and transcribed for two pianos. Before the end, though, comes the beginning, as Leonard Hambro and Yasha Zadie inaugurate their new series with Harold Bauer's transcription of Bach's Prelude and Fugue in C minor. We have invited the world's greatest expert on cocktail time to join us, Duncan Perney. About time you uh, had a word here on our anniversary album. I've had a few words <laughs> here and there over the years. As I recall our theme music, it was sort of a... <whistles> and about that point, yeah. I began to talk. Yeah. Anyway. I don't think it was Cocktails for Two. No. I really don't. No, I don't think it was. Bill Brookman notwithstanding, and a matter of fact, our theme sheet from uh, one of these early years notwithstanding, and I found an incorrect thing. It listed Sam Coslow as the composer, and he isn't. He was the lyricist, as I found out when well, I went to look it up. Uh, he would have words with us, wouldn't yeah, he? Yeah, a fellow named Johnson wrote the, the music. It was from a, a film, a 1934 film called Murder at the Vanities if you're interested. Well, However, since it's the wrong thing... possible. Anyway, yes. it wasn't in 1934, but it was uh, somewhere in the dim, dark past that cocktail time started. And actually, you started when at QXR? I started in uh, the summer of 42. Oh, isn't that a movie? Uh, two weeks after my 19th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than working. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and uh, it was fascinating then with our own orchestra, and uh, all sorts of interesting people going in and out. And oh. we had fairly lush studios, considering... Uh, that was at Fifth Avenue. At Fifth right? Avenue, yes. Uh -huh. Right opposite Tiffany's. <laughs> so on your lunch Lunch in the park, if you want to. <laughs> yes, it was marvelous. What do you remember about cocktail time? I remember that it had a zillion commercials for restaurants. Well, uh, there were two versions, really. One that was with the music, primarily. And one that was later on called Man About Town, which had 28 sponsors in 14 minutes. Uh -huh. yeah. That <laughs> kept us going. And no, that go I did a good cocktail. deal of with Sue Reed. Yeah. No, but go but back cocktail, to cocktail time, time itself, all right, that was uh, usually programmed by Al Simon. And uh, it was cocktail sort of music. Mm -hmm. And it had 
about 14 restaurants within an hour. All restaurants. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, they threw in somebody's swimsuit once. <laughs> that was difficult <laughs> to manage with the restaurants, but we managed. Mm. And to break up the monotony here and there, I used to use various accents that I, I've always been fascinated by them. When I was a kid, there was a groundskeeper at my grandparents' girls' school, the McDuffie School for Girls in Springfield, uh, Mr. Kempe, had a wonderful Scottish accent. And now and then you couldn't understand a word they had to say. <laughs> one of those things. And then I and one of the groundskeepers was Welsh. And I used to listen to his accent at that. My, my father sang in German and French and Russian. And uh, my mother knew French. I, was grow, I grew up with all of this. And I loved all the sounds of all the various accents. Mm -hmm. I began to incorporate some of these from people I had heard. I wasn't making fun of anybody. These were all things that yeah, I, you I just had a, loved. You had a New England restaurant that had something or other, and you always came out sounding like Titus Moody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's, uh, that's hard to avoid. <laughs> you get down east, you get down east. <laughs> if you don't have the foggiest, it's time to get out. Yeah. But no, these, these things always attracted me, and it seemed quite natural during uh, cocktail time to uh, change pace a little bit by using different accents. Mm -hmm. It also was a lighter frame altogether. Oh, yes. it was well, quite well, a well for one thing, it was all cocktail music. Yeah. Not the usual WQXR agenda at that time. I don't know how it ever got on the air, but it did. And did you of, start it? No. You just inherited it. I inherited right? that, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said it wasn't quite the same after that. <laughs> I, you can take it in either direction. Well, I guess so. But, but it, was, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. The only thing that that was a problem. There were a few people now and then who felt that I was making fun. You mean with the accents? With the accents, yes. And I never was. Mm -hmm. I was just, I loved them. And they were all from people I had a great attraction mm -hmm. for. But I remember a great fondness over the years. All of them. Mm -hmm. The French, the Germans, the uh, Scandinavians, and they're hard to say. <laughs> uh, all of them. They're always fascinating. And they seem to fit in beautifully with the restaurants. Yes. Well, um, so often there is an ethnic uh, involvement with the mm. restaurant, and it makes sense. So. Well, there, were, there was one one person that, that I created, though, out of my uh, the figment of my own imagination. The White Rock Girl? The White Rock Girl. I remember her vaguely. Blanche Boulder. <laughs> and, of course, there were those who asked, what connection does Blanche Boulder have to do with White Rock? And <laughs> I found that difficult to explain. Uh. Well, Duncan, what are some of the other uh, memories you have of WQXR? You've been here, as you said, quite a number of years now. Oh, yes. When our orchestra was conducted by Eddie Brown, when I first came here, later on, Leon Barzin. And we had some magnificent performers in the orchestra. Uh, Adolf Bush was a cellist of the Bush family. Hmm. You can't do better than that. That's right. Marvelous people. I understand that Abby Simon played the, uh, I don't know, the Hammond organ or something here in the early days. Yes, <laughs> uh, there was something like that. Yes, it was something that should never have been born. And it, it <laughs> what do you mean? You're, you're the great organ master. Not the electric organ of that era. Uh -huh. They have some electric organs now that are pretty good. Uh -huh. They can fool you. But Tico Tico doesn't go sit with no. you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not the early time. Well, it was almost the equivalent of a of a an electronic parlor organ mm -hmm. and considering what they cost then and what you can buy them for now the equivalent mm -hmm. now sells for about what oh hundred dollars mm -hmm. you can get that keyboard and hook it up to anything you want right. but that was an enormous mm -hmm. little instrument mm -hmm. but it fitted in our studio you couldn't possibly put a pipe organ there well i pleaded but <laughs> they weren't about to get another floor just to please yeah. me well duncan perney it is clear from all of the letters that we get, I read these uh, notes and cards and whatnot that come in from listeners, that you are very much part and parcel of WQXR. I mean, the two, two of you seem to go hand in hand, and especially, oddly enough, cocktail time, hmm. which constantly turns up. Prue Devon is another of the personalities yes. people remember vividly. Probably because it was so different from everything surrounding yes. the station. Yes, nights in Latin America. Yes, indeed. Oh, well, that was exciting, too. And she was a lot of fun. And there was another strange connection there. I'd actually known her when I was very small, but I never knew it. I never, until she told me about having known me. And when she was 
working also at, I think it was Edgewood School in Greenwich, Connecticut, where my parents were mm. for a time. And uh, all of these connections. That's right. They come around. Yeah, they do. Well, Duncan, thank you for joining us and uh, sparking our anniversary album. I'm going to uh, close out, actually, this little section by going back to Bill Brookman's letter. He says that uh, he listened to a lot of uh, Cy Walter, he said, on the show. Mm -hmm. But it was and there. Stan Freeman. That's right. But it was there, says Bill Brookman, that I first and last heard the beautiful Jerome Kern song, Poor Pierrot. I've never met anyone else who knows it. Could you use your influence, backed up by this letter, <laughs> to find a spot for it during the anniversary celebrations? I think that's the least we can do. Yes. Marvelous. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> 